It's on, guys. Are you sure? Yes. Yes. It's There's a red right. button yeah. out there. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our leadership and organizational theory course. I'm really excited uh, to introduce my very dear colleague and friend, Dr. Steve Clement. Uh, a little bit about Dr. Clement. Um, Dr. Clement spent his entire life serving this country. Uh, was a veteran in the Vietnam War. Uh, retired as a colonel uh, in the military, working under General Thurman. One of the books you're reading is about American generals. Uh, and then he was sent into exile. <laughs> Come here still. Maybe it won't be in a, uh, uh, He was actually sent into exile, but since he lived in, in here in Washington, in, in, in Texas, instead of sending him to Siberia, they sent him to Australia, into the mines. And so he spent a number of years at Rio Tinto working with Aborigines, with Australians on their organizational development. Came back here and did a lot of tours in the military, uh, works generally with most of the generals in the United States Army, with political appointees, mostly within the Department of Defense, and uh, uh, some of the largest multinational organizations in the world, um, from the uh, lowest level employee who just enters the workforce to the top role of the CEO. Uh, he just recently came from Europe on different assignments. It is his second book, uh, and he's just uh, releasing it. It's called It's All About Work, Organizing Organizing Your Company to Get Work Done. And Dr. Clement also told me that any student will get it for free, pertaining that you will read the book and write a short paper about it. Which usually guys don't read any books. Uh, <laughs> right, some of the books that uh, you're actually reading for this class it was actually introduced to me by Dr. Clement and uh, the book on the incompetence um, of military psychology. Generals. No, the generals. So that's a book that actually Dr. Clement told me that I had to read when I was in the Pentagon. And that's one of the books we're using in this class. So if you have a, if complaints about the book, Dr. Clement is here personally. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Clement. Uh, some of the, the slides are important. Uh, our organizations today are doing extraordinary well, as you are all, you're all well aware of. There are no crises, uh, full employment, uh, high promotion capabilities. <laughs> now, what Dr. Clement has spent his, most of his time investigating why our organizations fail. And in those few slides that he is going to show you is actually the answer why most of the organizations today, governments as well as the corporate entities, why they cannot succeed today. And with that, I tried to okay, good. Um, I, I thought about an article I was going to write, uh, Why Washington is Doomed to Failure. Uh, but I don't know I should, that I can go back to Washington with that kind of an article. But I'm going to talk a little bit about that today as we go through some things. Um, okay. And I encourage you to ask some questions. I'm going to go through, oh, I got a number of slides. You might, when I get to the end, you might generate a bunch of questions. And I also, uh, I want to take it out of theory and put it into practice, so I pick some people uh, that I want to talk about, to the people that you probably know, Jack Welch, Colin Powell, David Petraeus, uh, et cetera. So I want to take it away from theory to practice, uh, because it's one thing to talk about theory, it's a whole different thing to get out there and do it. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm in the middle right now of a big project where uh, we're actually still downsizing. Uh, I'm not sure where the economy is booming, maybe D.C., because of the uh, government, but it isn't booming anywhere else. Um, <clears throat> we're in the middle of producing probably the bottom third work of our workforce. Um, and we're struggling in Europe because the Europeans won't let you fire anybody as part of their operation. So, okay, next, how do I change the slides? Uh, you oh, on. just push it, right? Okay. My kids call me. Uh, I just Okay. I think we're. I think that, that both business and government are at an inflection point. Uh, I think the government has had a incredible growth over the last decade, um, and I think that uh, uh, with growth comes complexity. And when a company doubles in size or an agency doubles in size, its management capacity has to increase eightfold, <coughs> not double, eightfold. And I think we're under-resourced in terms of capability. Not that we don't have people with our have the capacity, we don't have them in the right place. I want to come back and talk a little bit about that. Uh, 
Uncertainty and change are the new constants. If you don't like change, tough. If you don't like uncertainty, doesn't matter because the world is uncertain. Increasing budget pressure, you ought to figure that out by now, right? With the sequester, that's all you hear around here. Um, and the good news is, lots of young people here, there's an aging cohort about to go out the door. And so you ought to be able to, uh, to replace it. I think if you don't do that, if you don't do something, focus on the core business, organize around the work, put strategic cuts in place, then you're going to become less relevant. You might still stay in existence, but you're going to become less relevant. And I think that that's what's happening. And I think some people are, believe it or not, stonewalling until they get more money. Um, they're in, I don't know where the money's going to come from. And so the issue is, uh, how do we, how do we make strategic cuts? How do we get rid of stuff? How many of you used to buy uh, these Ziploc bags in the store where you had a little pump and you took the air out of them and it kept them in the freezer? Oh, the vacuum sealer. Yeah, vacuum sealer. Right? You can't buy them anymore, right? They're gone. They took them off because they weren't selling enough. When's the last time you saw a government program cut? We never cut anything. We keep everything even though there's some duplication. So the interesting issue is strategic cuts in terms of those things. So, that's the inflection point. Backwards. <clears throat> Just where do we come from? Where did this work come from? I had the luxury of working with Dr. Jacks. I started off a uh, classical behavioral scientist at West Point teaching in the leadership department. Uh, uh, how many of you have seen the, the, that movie, uh, Men Who Stare at Goats? I did all that crap. And it doesn't work. I gave up all this pseudo-psychology stuff. I don't care whether you're an ENTJ, Myers-Briggs. It drives me crazy. What are the red, yellow, green dots for? Oh, the red dot means she loses her temper when you give her bad news. So I don't want to put up with her temper, so I don't tell her things are going to hell in the handbasket. We spend so much time on personality stuff, it doesn't matter. So I got out of all that. I ran into this guy who was into the structure business. Uh, said, if you don't have the structure right, you're never going to get it right. <clears throat> this guy happened to be at McKinsey and uh, at GE, and he came up with the business unit. All of this began to come into play. General Thurman brought them all together when he was the vice chief. And then we, I left the Army and got out and went into corporate world to apply it. Um, and so that's kind of where the background it came from. Uh, I'll show you in a minute our project chief that uh, on our project that we were doing back in at Rio Tinto in the 90s went on to become their chairman and CEO. Um, so it's more than just the theory. Two things. After 50 years of research, we found some things out about work and levels of work and the fact that work varies in, in complexity from the bottom to the top, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And guess what? People also vary in capability. And it seems to be innate. You're born with it. It's got nothing to do with IQ. I don't care what your grades are. I don't care if you get A's or D's. It's got nothing to do with whether you have the capacity to handle complexity. And we'll talk some more about that. <clears throat> and that's distributed this way. There's a lot more people that can handle work of low complexity that can handle high complexity tasks. And there are some elements that go into that, and I'm going to go to that. So two themes, work, structure, levels of work, complexity, people with different capacity. I hate to tell you this, but we're not all equal. I know it's going to hurt you. And some of us peak at age 20, some of us peak at 30, some of us die before we stop growing in terms of capability. And it's got nothing to do with your race, sex, or anything else. We got onto that. When you work in third world countries like Australia, you're dealing with aboriginals. They don't read or write. But the chief of the tribe is chief because he makes more sense of his world. The sky, the rocks, the moon. Same thing with the medicine man in Africa. They don't read or write, but they have the greater capacity. So we got onto those kinds of things. And we'll talk about the other variables. Okay, so that's kind of a look there. Um, a little bit about structure. You can organize any way you want, as long as you do it this way. <laughs> Start off with, what's the work? The reason the book is called, it's all about work. What's the work? What do you want me to do? The work at this level is hands-on. 
call this customer, answer this complaint, deal with this issue, etc. Um, it gets more complex as you go up, but you start off with the work. <clears throat> you then create a structure, consistent, one role and only one role to do the work, and you put a person in the role that has the capacity to do the work. I don't care if they're nice, I don't care if they're old, I don't care if they're young. Can they get their arms around the work to be able to do it? Okay, that's simple. Now, that's the answer, right? You ought to be able to run any large corporation, any major department in this government with no more than seven or eight levels, from the worker to the boss. You got more than that, you got too many. You might need more pay grades, but you don't need more levels. So one of the interesting issues, why in the world does a GS-12 work for a GS-13? They're both doing the same work. They don't add value. It's all about having more capacity to add value. And I know you've never worked for somebody who doesn't add value. <laughs> How frustrating that is, right? And guess what? It's very interesting to see a situation where the subordinate is more capable than their boss. It drives you crazy if you're the subordinate. And the first time you can, you're out of there. <clears throat> okay. Now, what, what do I do here? What do we do when we want to downsize? Oh, we take out a layer. We didn't take out the work. We take out a layer. The work didn't go away. So guess what? We just sucked everybody down to do the work. So, who do we fire first when we're out of money? All the admin people, right? The admin work doesn't go away, so guess who gets stuck doing the admin work? You all. There's no time left to do the strategic work. And so what happens is the system, I call it the gravity effect. Uh, <clears throat> no, you got to get the right structure with the right people in the structure focusing on the right work. <clears throat> now, this work gets more nebulous as you go higher. The last fun job in any organization is this level right here, where you give an order and they actually do it. Above level three, that's in the, in the military, that's the battalion. In industry, that's the unit. Above that level, they reach out. They don't care. Anonymity sets in. And so you ask anybody up here, what's, your, what's the best job you ever had in this company? They'll tell you it's down here where they had this feeling, they knew their people, etc. So it's important. So <clears throat> that structure, very simple. Start off with the work. Make sure you put the right structure consistent with the work. Now, nebulous policy formulation, strategy development. Here's the question for you. What do you think our strategy is to deal with PTSD? A traumatic brain injury. Medication and therapy. We have a hell of a lot of programs. But what's our strategy? Cradle to grave? We don't have a strategy. We have programs. We're executing programs, but we don't have a strategy. We haven't. The people that were supposed to work on that worked on programs. Why programs are more tangible, easier. This is hard work to do. You don't need a lot of people, but you need the right people. I'll come back and talk a little bit more about that. So, here's level three. It's more complex than those little things I had on the left. Actually, these are the categories of work, and these are just some examples of what you need to do. So, if I want to know whether you can do level three work, I want to know, can you string data together and extrapolate and reach a conclusion? Can you develop a set of alternatives? Do you have the capacity when you are looking at a goal to say, what could possibly go wrong with this sales goal? What's the probability that might happen and what am I gonna do about it? Because my boss is not gonna change. So if I'm a Pepsi sales unit sales manager, what's the probability Coke drops their price? What's the risk associated with that and what am I gonna do about it? I can't just come back and whine to my boss. So I want people at three to ask what I call what if questions. The absence of what if questions is crisis management. It's hole in one golf. Didn't go in the hole. Now, now what the hell do we do? We're stuck. 
Okay. So, <clears throat> manage contracts at the regional corporate level, negotiate agreements, anticipate obstacles, synchronize multiple budgets. So the work gets more complex and there's more details in there. I just wanted to give you an example of, uh, of it. it's all about work. If you don't know what the work is, how can you make a judgment about whether a person can do the work if you don't know what the work is? We make judgments all the time about people, but wouldn't it be nice if they said, you're not ready for this work because I don't see evidence that you can do this, this, or this, as opposed to just saying, you're not ready. What do I do with that? I want to be ready. Tell me how I get ready. Give me some data. Okay. Here's your challenge. Here's the challenge. I talked a little bit about growth. Increasing size requires more management capacity. Change is ever increasing. It's not going to go away. Uncertainty. There's more uncertainty at the strategic levels than there is at the lower levels. All of that's coming together. you got to do more of less. So, i got a new term I want to talk about later. I've replaced succession planning with the term surpassion planning. I can't afford to replace a current incumbent with somebody that has the same size shoes. I need to move you into the job with bigger shoes. You've got to have bring more to the table than your replacement. Because the world is getting more complex, not less. So the next generation has to be better, not equal to this generation. So I've got to find you young, and I've got to move you consistent with that. Okay. Here's the number of people in the world that have the capacity to work at the various levels. Sorry, there's not that many people that can work on very complex problems. <clears throat> One would hope they'd all be in Washington, right? We have very complex problems. I hate to tell you this, but they ain't here. Uh, we're not going to solve the problems. Probably why I don't work here anymore. <laughs> okay. If you want to get some work done, here's the formula. You have to have the innate cognitive capacity, I don't like that term, mental capacity to get your arms around the work at a given level. That's a necessary but not sufficient condition. If you can't get your arms around the work, it doesn't matter. You have to value the work. I use value as different. I use values as a motivator. I think people work on things they like. I think you will do what you like and you study what you like and you don't study what you don't like and I think your kids do the same thing and it's got nothing to do with whether they're turned on. It's whether the physics teacher turns them on to physics or the chemistry teacher turns them on to chemistry, etc. So, skill knowledge, <clears throat> Wisdom, being wise in the ways of the world. How do you get wise in the ways of the world? Experience. You go home and tell your wife, you give her constructive criticism, right? <laughs> you learn very quickly, that doesn't work. Yeah. How do I look? You look wonderful in terms of that. Okay. So, or you see, you learn from other people how not to do it. And then temperament. I don't care what your personality is as long as it's not so deviant that it interferes with your ability to get your work. I don't care if you're introspective or an extrovert. Can you get the work done? It's not the manager's job to practice psychotherapy. I'm sorry, there are screwed up people out there. Some of my generals, you read Dixon's book on the psychology of military incompetence. The problem there is they kill people. The problem in industry is they just lose money. Okay? <clears throat> so Necessary but not sufficient condition. You can have all of these, be a really nice guy or gal, have all the skill and knowledge, but if you can't get your arms around level three work, level four work, etc., ain't gonna happen. You're not gonna be able to do it. So, we spend an inordinate amount of time training people. Guess what? If you have capacity, I don't care what you're experience or skill and knowledge basis. You'll learn it very quickly. I'll put you in a job and stretch you, and you'll learn it. <clears throat> okay, we talked a little bit about it. I think temperament basically is a job fit issue. Obviously, if you don't like people, you shouldn't be a flight attendant. <laughs> right? And you shouldn't work on a counter, behind the counter, 
when it snows. The other people are going to bitch and race hell with you. Okay. If you don't like people, then go into engineering. <laughs> or go into something where you don't have to deal with it. You deal with petri dishes instead of dealing with individuals. Okay. We think that uh, capacity is constitutional. It's built in from birth. It's generic. It's maturational. I'll show you how it matures. <clears throat> Starts at very early. We can see evidence of it at earliest age three or four. We can begin to predict where they'd be. Now, I'm not really, this is really interesting territory. Americans do not like the fact that Everybody can't possibly be the CEO or the four-star general. I hate to tell you this, but they can't. They don't have it. Not everybody has the same capacity. And be careful. I'm not talking IQ. I'm not talking about skill or knowledge. I'm talking about the innate capacity. Street corner gang leaders are street corner gang leaders because they make more sense to their gang. That's why they're chosen as the leader. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we got at it by looking at earnings. Why do people get paid more? Sometimes they marry the boss's daughter, but generally you get paid because you have greater capability, generally. Uh, we saw it in some childhood theories. The problem with Piaget, his sample size was three, but he studied them from birth till 23, but he had a small sample size. There's early evidence of kids gra grasping length, complex language, and then our own evidence. You ever hear of the Peter Principle? They still teach that? The Peter Principle is a concept where you promote somebody to the next level and they're incompetent. Hmm. You promote them to their level of incompetence. The Peter Principle occurs because work varies in quantum shifts from one level to the next. Just because you could do work at level three doesn't necessarily mean you can do work at the next higher level. But how do we get promoted around here? We promote people who did well at this level at the next level. And, and by the way, Strategic level work is really different than operational type work. Some people are very good at operational work, but not very good at the other kind of work. So, these are the maturational curves. This is level. It's kind of an interesting age. I cut it off at uh, 20. Most of you are up over that. Uh, but I can extend it down here. <clears throat> and um, I cut it off at 70. Now I have an interesting question for you. What do people do when between 70 and 85? Highly capable people, I want And this is how it matures. And I've gone to uh, four curves. I've had eight, but you really get nervous when I put you in eight. So you think you feel better. And I can get rid of the red altogether. I can just tell you that generally people progress this way. Some people progress this way. Some people go this way. In terms of their capacity, this is just capacity. This is not skill knowledge, it's not experience, it's your capacity. And you will, you know why you give your busiest task, or your toughest task, your busiest person? Because they have the greatest capacity. You overload them, then you drive them out of the company. Mm -hmm. And you don't give the done hard task because they won't do the damn thing. So you just tolerate them. And so guess what? Susie gets upset because she's working her tail off, and old Bob over here is cruising. And he goes home at 5 o'clock, and Susie's working until 7. They're both getting the same pay, and we don't want to deal with it. And we wonder why Susie left the first minute she could. Okay. All right. Let's... You don't have to occupy all the jobs. Here's the five things you need to do to be a CEO. There's only five things. You don't have to have every damn job and every function. You need, to, you need to have line responsibility. You need to be accountable for the output of other, other people. If they screw up, you screw up. If they're successful, you aren't. I call it man, leading from a failure position. You take all the failures, they take all the successes. You need to be accountable. You need to start something from scratch or fix something that's in trouble. You need a, a line in the staff job. You need to go to a staff job. You can't just be a staffer all your life. And then you need a leap in scope of significant. That's all you need. Those are the development experiences to get you up here. You don't need to have every job, but you need a career track. And who's in charge of your career track? 
somebody in the company ought to be running the talent pool, right? So the other day, I'll call the youngster came in and I asked the question, I said, who's your number one store manager? Best one in the whole company. And they gave me the name. I said, how old is he? 41. Too old. They said, what do you mean too old? I said, a store manager is a level two job. If he's 41, where the hell is he going to go? I can't get him up there in time, in terms of that. Um, if he's in a level two job at 41, here's the track he's on. He's going to be a unit manager by the time he's 60, maybe. Now, why wasn't he? I want a store manager at 24. I want him going this way. If they can't hack it at 24, then I, got, I need to do something else with him. But it was interesting. He got into some interesting discussions about time. But if I want to move you consistent with your capability, that's what's going to really turn you on, then I've got to have a strategy. And that strategy means I've got to understand work and understand the requirements and, and have a plan to move you. And you need to make sure that somebody in the damn company is interested in moving you consistent with your capability. Or you need to start looking for another job. Because the only way you bump up a level is to go somewhere else. Have you ever heard the story, I'll get promoted when so-and-so dies? <laughs> yeah. You know, Toyota used to have uh, lifetime employment. But Toyota also had a death room. They had a room where they sent people to die that weren't capable. They didn't fire them. They just sent them up to another room. You had a desk and you had a you didn't have a telephone, you didn't have an out basket. They didn't care what you did. But you had to be there all day. <laughs> because they didn't want blockers. So I'm working in a company and we have nine regional VPs, level four, nine of them. Eight of them won't move. How do I what do I do? Eight won't move. They're all good producers, but they won't move. I got eight blockers. What do I tell this young three who wants to become a five when there's no place to go? So guess what? We designated some number are movable positions. You don't want it, you're not getting promoted. You get promoted, you're going to move. Uh, here's a couple of examples. Everybody in the military goes up to the war college, by and large, along the same track. Wow, look what happens afterwards. Some of these people pop out to become generals. Four-star generals, three-star, two-star generals. Most of them go on to be retired as colonels. Wow, what happened here? Where, if this curve is right, where were these people? So I went back and I looked at Colin Powell. What was Colin Powell doing when he was a major back here? He was working in the White House. He was a White House fellow. So intuitively, the system had figured it out. My problem was, how many people did we miss? How many people did we miss because we didn't have a strategy for doing that? Here's how ICSs go. They go up a function this way. They tend to stay in the same function. They're more like warrant officers, specialists, than they are generalists. You know why they call them generals? In industry, they call them general managers. They're generalists. A general manager in industry has to integrate marketing, sales, production into one cohesive business operation. These are the political appointees. I have a better chart coming up. This is where the roles are. I'll tell you where the people are. This is the complexity of the work. <coughs> That's good. We'll wait till later. All right, here I put a couple of people on this chart that you might know. Jack Welch. At 34, Jack Welch is running a billion dollar business. At 39, Jack Welch was running GE. At 50, Jack Welch retired. He was burned out. Then what did he do? 
His capacity didn't stop. This is Rod Carnegie who ran Rio Tinto. At, 30, at 39, he was the chief financial officer of Rio Tinto. At 44, he was the CEO. Now he's bugging me, saying, what, what do you want me to do now? He's up here at, at 80. He's not dead. He said, I'm not dead yet. I'm ready to work. I'm ready to do some work. This is Eisenhower. Eisenhower came up military, went to here colonel and became a brigadier and then became four star. We obviously had capacity, but the system didn't recognize that. And then went on there. Um, here's Colin Powell. Notice he popped out. Those kinds of capabilities. So what's he doing now? People with these kinds of capabilities don't run bigger and bigger enterprises. They take on social issues. They take on more complex issues at the next level in terms of those kinds of things. <clears throat> so here comes Dave Petraeus, which gets into some personal trouble, but still has the capacity. So we've got some interesting issues. What, what do these people do? Most CEOs leave their companies at 55 or under because of burnout. So from 55 to 65, they're on boards. From 65 to 80, what do they do? They have this kind of capacity. Well, think about it. How about asking some of these people to work on a level nine problem facing the country, such as the debt problem? So what did we do? We took Simpson and Bowles. Dr. Bowles, former president of North Carolina, University of North Carolina, Simpson, former that. They came up with some solutions, didn't have a dog in the fight, and what did we do? We blew it, blew it off, right? threw it away. We got good level four solutions to level nine problems. That ought to cause you to drink. Because <laughs> it ain't gonna work. Okay, so you double in size, you gotta get more capacity. Do you think we have dramatically increased the capacity in this town in the last decade in terms of capability. The government's gotten bigger, but have we increased? We haven't increased the numbers. So who's doing the work? So <clears throat> I told you about surpassing planning. Look, succession planning is fill existing shoes, fill vacancies, cope with the future. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in you got to bring bigger shoes, more capacity. You got to focus on new ways, innovation and creativity. You got to create the future. You got to surpass the people that are there. I need you all to be better than my group because the world's getting more complex. So you can't just do what we did. You got to do better. But we've got to find out who you are, where you are, and move you consistent with that because. You and I want to work to our full capability, either on the job or off the job. That's why your people with the greatest unused capacity will be doing all kinds of stuff off the job. I ran into a plant engineer at a Pepsi plant who was the head of the school board, head of the Kiwanis Club, and coach of the local soccer league. He, would, he could have run that plant. And you know what they told me? And I said, why don't you promote him? Well, he's too young. He's 28. So what? Why well, can't run a plant 28? I said, where's that written in stone? I said, high capacity people have capability. Okay. I love it when they say too young. Too young to do what? Okay. Um, I, I did two assessments, one in the 80s and one in the mid 2000. Um, General Thurman asked me, he had, he had a gut feeling that the general officer pool was weak, much like Dixon wrote about the Officer. We had a good feeling. So he sent me out to assess all the generals. And I came back and I said, you're absolutely right. We have 12 four-star positions. You don't have enough. This is the position. This is the capability. This is where they're actually working. I said, you don't have enough people coming up as generals to fill the positions that are going to be vacant in the next three years. His intuitive feel was right. The question was, what do we do about it? We've got to change generals. Now, that was kind of a dicey kind of a, a situation. Uh, but we had too many brigadiers working at the colonel level, too many major generals. They were all pulled down to lower level. So we had to make some significant shifts. 
So then I went and I did something else. I went to the war college and I assessed war college students for about 10 years. Didn't tell them what I was doing. Gave them a whole bunch of tests. Myers, Briggs, all kinds of crap. But I also gave them an assessment. They predicted who would be generals. They put the data away. And just let the system 0.8 predictability from the assessment tool. Never could publish it because it's too sensitive, obviously. How would you like it if I came in and gave you this instrument and then told you, you better hang it up and repeat? Or, or you got to get out of here because you have, you know, you're, you're being underutilized. So I want to talk a little bit about how you can do it practically. I don't believe in using assessment tools. I believe in having managers make the judgments using some instruments to help them. Because managers make the judgments all the time anyway. It's the old boy, old girls club. But let's give them some tools to help them do that. And let's limit the judgment to three years. I don't see you getting promoted in the next two or three years. What good does it do me to tell you I don't see you getting promoted ever? Even if I believe that. What good does it do me? And I don't believe that the assessments are so invaluable that that's true. So I want to get multiple data points. So that's how I would deal with that, uh, that particular issue. And here's my last one, and then we can have some interesting discussions. There's 230 SESs in the Army. About a third of them are capable of working at higher levels. Another third are about right and a third are over their heads. They shouldn't even be there. Here are the political appointees. Seven four-star positions. Here's where they actually work. It. Most of them were working two or three levels below where the work was. So they were dragging the whole organization down to their level of capability. Here's the deputies that were here and they were working even worse. So the point there is that you have a level seven problem and you have a level three person working it, you're going to get a level three and it isn't going to work. So we have level eight problems in the city facing the country. Just think about it. Tonight we're, they're going to vote this week on guns to do something. All right. Do you think that's a simple problem? Gun violence? I mean, think about it. There's at least mental health issues. There's registration issues. There's a whole bunch of stuff wrapped up in that. It's at least a level six or seven problem. And we have some great level three people voting on that. Um, and guess what? We, we get what we vote for. We put them in office. We're paying the price. You think the deficit's a level three problem? It's unlimited money, right? Just tax them. Where's it coming from? Okay. Right. Every time we were, we screw students all the time because we raise your tuition. And then we give the banks more money to give you, so we raise your tuition again for your loans. And then we said, well, we they can't afford to pay the loan back because there's no jobs. That'd be nice if we guaranteed that you'd have a job. Uh, and when's the last time a guidance counselor told you that, why are you studying that? There's no work. Okay. Anyway, I don't want to be too depressing. So, anyway, that's, so let's, that's kind of the background. Structure, capacity. You got to do them both. There's some interesting issues about both. Structure is easy because it's not, doesn't involve the human. Well, let's go. Yeah, let's go. This is the easy part. What's the work? Establish the structure. What gets nasty is when you put the face into the space. Now you're dealing with the human dimension. So um, make sure you get the right structure. One role and only one role. Here's our problem. We have all kinds of pay grades. Pay people whatever you need to pay them. I don't care. If you're a senior engineer, fine. Pay them more money. But don't screw it up by putting a layer in there. Potential assessment requires Proper separation. I don't think the immediate manager should assess potential. Why? Because they tend to pick people like themselves. 
The manager, two levels up, should be assessing potential. Not the immediate manager. The immediate manager can have their say, but they shouldn't be assessing potential. So, how would you like to meet your manager two levels up assessing your potential he doesn't even know you? Wouldn't it be nice if they spent an hour a year with you talking about your career? Oh, here's what you have. Here's what happens. I don't have time. The cost of leadership is management time. So what does it say to you if I tell you I don't have an hour a year to give to talk to you about your career and where you're going and what your aspirations are and how you can best meet them in this company? What does that say to you? Because my, I'll bet you my corporate value statement says we value our people. But my operating value says I don't care. Or you come in to talk to me and I look at my watch. What do you want to talk about, Susie? Not great nonverbal, right? In terms of that. So then what do we do? If we have too many people, we follow it off to the deputy or to our office assistant or HR. It's not their job. I want to talk to the boss. So you got to get the proper separation. And there's an interesting role in there in terms of that kind of thing. And then you get into the whole notion of capacity. Um, and do they have the capability? We stick labels on people in terms of IQ and all kinds of tests, and it doesn't seem to make any sense to me. I'm interested in, uh, in doing that. And then the other thing I just want you to think about is let's make sure, let's make sure that we're tapping your capability at the right age, at the right pace consistent with your capacity. You want to work to your full capability. That's when you're going to be the, the happiest, that's when you're going to be the most productive, and that's when the organization, everybody's going to win. So we need to be able to figure out, it's okay if I lose some good people, if I don't have enough spots. My job is to help you get a job consistent with your capability. If I can't get all of you into the right job, then I have an obligation morally to tell you if you can find a better job elsewhere, take it. I'd much rather have a pool of subordinates that are more capable and I can't fill all the jobs than a pool of duds who can't get the work done. Because what they'll do is they'll drag the whole organization down to their level. All right, so any questions? You know, it's a lot of stuff. So you're now experts. Yes? Just seeking your view on managers who would like, uh, wouldn't promote you even when they realize that you have the capability, but they would kind of like keep you at a lower level even though your capability is like up here. And who didn't, somebody, somebody didn't promote you? Yes, but you have the capability, you can do the job really right. well. But they, they wouldn't like help you move out of that level, even if they know you can do level four work. You have the capacity to do it. See, but they wouldn't like help you out. Yeah, I, I think I think there needs to be a transparent system in the company where you can initiate a request to talk to your boss two levels up about why you think you need to get out. I think if they don't initiate it, you ought to be able to initiate it. And you ought to have the opportunity to sit down with your boss two levels up and tell them why you think you're the hot shot. Because in any company, see, if I'm going to run a company, I'm, I want 6% continuous improvement every year. I'll tell you how I'd go after the deficit here. I'd cut 6% of the budget every year. They're whining about what they cut now. I want 5% continuous improvement target every year. So I want, who's going to do that work? I'm going to use my high potentials, pull them up, give them a project, and tell them to go out there and figure out a way to, to reduce the whatever. Lean Six Sigma to reduce the crap we're doing to make this thing more efficient. And take the money we save and reinvest it. And you, it's project work where you, you, you should test your youngsters. So if I don't believe you're ready, but you believe you're ready, I can't let that just fester. So, I take you, put you in a job that's more complex than your current role, see how you do. If you don't do so well, I tell you. Then I put you back in your old job and I haven't ruined you. I'm not going to promote you until I test you. But I want you to tell me you're ready. 
I would love to have eight people coming up to me asking for time on my calendar and tell me I'm ready to get out of here. I'm working for this. And guess what? Whose job is it to assess the leadership effectiveness of a subordinate manager? So, I don't, supposing this guy's a dud, your job is to have a relationship two levels down to assess the leadership effectiveness of this person. So, I sit down with you. Let's talk about your career. I'd like to move. Where? Anywhere. When? Now. Oh, red light ought to come on. Your red light is on. Something's going on. Or, boss comes in and says, she's got to go. She's a deadbeat. Wait a minute. She's been a high performer all her life. All of a sudden, what the hell happened? People don't just change overnight. What's going on? So, I've got to be on the lookout. I've got to be the detective to find out, is that a personality clash between these two people? I can't afford to lose my high potential. Guess what? High potentials are a pain in the butt to manage. Because they don't just do what you ask them to do, they do more. They work to their full capability. Jeez, I just asked her for this report. What song was that crap she did? Well, she's working to her full capability. And so, if I'm threatened by a subordinate who's more capable than I am, I'm going to squash them. I'm going to hold them back. And, and my God, why would I give up my best worker? Jesus, did I got to work. I'm not going to give up my best subordinate. Well, guess what? Culturally, I better do that. So, there's lots of stuff in there that needs to be... We need a system, not just... Fortuitous. It works today because you might happen to run into somebody and say something, or they decide to take, but you might have a boss that says, oh, you're a troublemaker. I'm not going to put up with that crap. You're not allowed to go see the boss. What, you had a question? You answered that. Okay. Yes? Um, I actually have two questions, but I'll ask this one. Going back to the slide where you have the maturation curve. Okay. Um, I noticed at skill or level one, I didn't see much change with rate of change with uh, over the course of that person's career. Right. Why would you think that would be the case? Is it lack of career development? Is it lack of education or training? Because no, it's kind of discerning to know that if I'm starting off at level one, I will never get to level three, four, or five. I would never tell you that. <laughs> Because you might be, there might be lots of reasons why um, you've been underemployed, you've been beaten down by whatever, the system. I would never tell you, I, I might say to you, I don't see you as an operator moving to level two in the next couple of years because of this, this, and this. But I want to put it back to work. Don't just, see right now we make these judgments. I don't ever want to make a judgment about a person unless I can anchor that judgment in some tangible work. What good does it do tell me to tell you that you're plateaued at level one? Even plateaued people want to be nurtured and loved and told they're okay. You know what happens when you get promoted beyond your level of capability? You get stressed out. You get to work the long hours and put up with all the crap. You go home with the ulcer. <laughs> so not everybody wants to do that. And it's okay to be a level one person, an operator. Not everybody necessarily wants to do that. But the good news is that we under-assess people. There's more capability in this room than any assessment tool would suggest. All I need to do is get you in the right position and stretch you and let you work to your capacity and create the conditions for that so that you are successful. So, but there are some people who aren't going to progress beyond two. I'm sorry, they aren't. They don't have the capability to operate it at level three or four. Remember, the first three levels are personal. You know your people, they know you, you know. If you're going to lead someone at line accountability, you need to know what's going on in their life. You need to know what's going on with their kids. You need to know that if their kids are sick, that that's going to affect their work, and you've got to be able to adjust your leadership style accordingly. There's only so many people you can do that with if they're all doing the same job. The maximum number is about 60 if it's a call center. 
if it's more complex, it's smaller than that. So it's having some numbers to be able to do that. Next higher level, the numbers are about 300. They need to know that you're the boss and you need to know at least half of them and you need to be able to do that. Uh, so the work changes at the various levels. So I hope I've answered the first one. What's not, you're still not comfortable that... Uh, That's a high potential over there. Okay. <laughs> um, my second question, you said that level, two levels up are those individuals that should be assessing your role and responsibility. But how often does uh, someone two levels up know the role and responsibilities of someone two levels down? Well, that's a good question. I think that's what's wrong with the damn organization. Because they don't, and they should. That's their job. Their job, two levels up, is they're, they're, they're accountable. Their work, their leadership work. I always put work in terms of accountability. They are accountable to assess the leadership effectiveness of this unit manager over this manager. How can you possibly do that if you don't know what's going on down here? They are accountable for three-level teamwork. They are accountable for mentoring. Here's the coach. Mentoring is helping this person operate through their full capability. Let's get some definitions straight there. We use slippery things. So there's some clear accountabilities that apply two levels up that need to be laid out. You're not the immediate manager. And when you're having a discussion with the person two levels down, you don't let the discussion focus on the immediate manager without them being there because it's not your job. You have to assume the only time they ever do anything right is when you're there. And the only time they ever do any, so you've got to be on the, on the lookout. But you have, there has to be a system and there's accountabilities at work. And that's why leadership, it's, you're not only leading your immediate team, you're leading now and you're doing some other leadership tasks. You don't ever, at the strategic level, you're operating, you're doing operational leadership, tactical leadership, and strategic leadership. At this level, when, you know, I, I ask CEOs, when's the last time you amused? You know what amusing is? Sitting back, putting your feet up on the table, thinking about what's going to happen to this company. How can you envision the future, and vision, and set the stage if you never think about that? They don't have any time. They're going to meetings all the time. So who's doing the music? Well, we hire consultants. <laughs> they don't know what the hell's going on in the company. Or we hire strategic planning cells. Look, planning is the boss's job. So if you want to be an effective leader, the first thing you got to be is competent in your own job. If you're not competent in your own work, you don't have a ghost of a chance of leading subordinates. I'm not going to follow you in combat if you don't know what the hell you're doing. Because I'm going to get dead. So guess what? You need to be confident in terms of that. So leadership requirements increase as you go up. And it takes time. I call it the leadership arithmetic. They don't want to do it. So when I hear, when I hear a leader tell me, I don't have 22 hours to talk to 22 subordinates about their career. I say, well, that's interesting. What do you do with those 22 hours? What they're doing is they're doing they're running the damn operation. They're not doing their job. The way you free up time is you get out of doing their job. You step up and do your job. And guess what? You all can actually do that work. If I got out of your way. My son used to run a Kmart store right out of college. And I asked him, he'd been through this with me with Dr. Jackson. I said, what's the complexity of that job? He says, ah. I'm a level half. <laughs> I said, what do you mean you're in a level two job? He says, no, I have no discretion or judgment. I can't, I'm told by De Detroit what clothes to put out when. I'm told when, what hours to operate. So he gave me the example. He said, he was in Dallas. He said, uh, it's November. Detroit says we're selling gloves, winter gloves. It's 92 degrees in Dallas in November. I'm, cashing out all the shorts and all the other summer stuff to get rid of it. Gets chewed out by his boss. He's not following the plan. So he said, I don't, I'm in a level two role, but I don't have level two discretion or judgment. When you put this system in place, I assume you're competent to prove it otherwise. I assume you have the capacity to work to your full capability. And by the way, freedom is not the absence of limits, because we all have limits. 
Freedom is knowing what my limits are, and I want you to be as innovative and as creative as possible to the full extent of my limits. That's why I have to set the context for you. But it's a total package. Now, you just asked the real question behind all this is that why don't companies do it? Because it's hard work. And so they go out and hire the wizard to come in and give them a razzmatazz speech on leadership, and then they wonder why nothing changes. Because it doesn't work. There is no simple solution. When we did this at Rio Tinto in Australia, it was a five-year project. It took us a year to get the structure right. It took us a year to get the systems in. Wouldn't it be nice if we paid people for the work they do? <laughs> Shouldn't the compensation system pay? So here's a real story. I met Pepsi, and Pepsi makes more money on a 20-ounce <clears throat> bottle than they do on a 12-pack. More profit. So, one summer, I got my youngest son out there. I said, go out there and ride the truck. Tell me what's going on, because if I get on the truck, they, don't, they do everything right. <clears throat> and I said, what's going on? How come when I go on a route, the vending machines are empty? So he came back and he said, it's very simple. The route driver is paid by volume. So <clears throat> he drops 12 cases at the gas station and doesn't bother to fill the vending machine. Because it takes them as long to fill the vending machine as it is to go to three gas stations for 12 cases each. <clears throat> so then I went into the um, cop people. I said, when's the last time you rode a route? Oh, we don't go out there. That's tough work out there. <laughs> and I said, well, wait a minute. Why are we paying for volume when our profits come from vending machines? And that led us to create vending routes. So, for example, uh, the Sears Tower in Chicago was one route. And one guy spent all day, that's all he did was filling vending machines up and down that particular uh, place. But <clears throat> the systems people need to be in touch with the front line. <clears throat> Design your company around the front line, get this right, this is where the bulk of your people are, and you make some money. Screw this one up, it doesn't matter what happens up here. Most of the problems I find in companies are up here. If they would simply structure this right, get the right people and get out of their way, guess what? They'd do pretty well because these people are competent and capable. Um, but they, they're all down there telling you what to do. Yes? Um, who's responsible to implement this system and to make sure that the system will be... Uh, who's accountable for that? Um, responsible to set up, set up this system and to make sure that the system will work accordingly to what it was set up for. Well, if you, have an e if you have an EVP of HR, or one of the EVP of HR tasks is to ensure that the structure supports the culture and reinforces the value. So he ought to have, he or she ought to have an OD person that knows something about structure. And so, yeah, they would start there. Uh, CEO has to back it, but the, there has to be somebody there. Now, when we did the project at Rio Tinto, we took, we took a level four line operator from the field. We brought him in to do the OD project in HR. Now, Rio Tinto never hired any staff members. Any staff person either mined it or sold it before they went into any other support job. That because the CEO said, if you don't know what the business is, I don't want you working in this company. So we had four people, I think eight people total in HR at corporate headquarters. Only one permanent. The rest all came in screaming and shouting. They didn't want to be there. These were operators who were tailored in. Well, the project manager came in, ran the project for two years, got the structure right, left to run a coal operation, eventually became the CEO of Rio Tinto and is now the chairman of Qantas. Um, understands the notion. You take highly capable people that have future runway and you put them in these kinds of projects. That's how you test your youngsters. Take your younger, highly capable people, put them into complex projects. So you've got a Lean Six project, fine. Put a youngster that's capable and let her go. And she'll probably take off on that and do a great job. Um, Okay, we have some more questions. Yes? Uh, you talked about job fit issue and also about capability. Um, the thing is, like, some people are really able to get a job done, but they, ju they just don't like what they're doing. 
So when they don't like what they're doing. Yeah, they don't right. like what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. and so, like some teachers, they're really great as teachers. They know how to right. help others understand what they're saying, but they just hate children or, you know. So, I mean, it's kind of like when you talk about job fit issue, you can fit in a job and just because you have the capabilities and not because, you know, you have like a character going with this job. Yeah. If you don't value the work, then you shouldn't do it. I can't imagine going to work every day hating what I do. I like what I do. But I can't imagine if, if you're in a job where you hate going to work every day, why are you doing it? We need to figure out if you're the boss and you've got somebody that, that feels that way, you need to help them go somewhere where they're comfortable. I, I think you, if I want you to put your heart and soul into the work, and I do, I want you to be committed, and I want you to be enthusiastic, and I want you to work to your full capability, then if I want that from you, what do you want from me? You want fairness, opportunities to get ahead, chance to participate in what you do, and offer, you know, so I think we should have those kinds of discussions. And yeah, I think we should encourage people to go elsewhere. I, every time I fly, I usually tell a flight then, you know, I don't know why you don't get to go into another line of work. Because obviously you don't like people. <laughs> Do you say that for real? Seriously. What? Do you say that really? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I say, you know, I'm sorry. But I, I'm out there, I look at the I look at the applying the concepts. If you don't like to deal with people and you're in a stressful situation with weather delays, etc., you're gonna get angry people. I don't blame them for taking I mean sometimes they put up with a lot of hassle. And I'll I'll go to their protection, I'll say, You're a jerk. It's not her fault that the damn airport's closed. Mm -hmm. You know? You ought to get out of here, because you're just creating trouble for all of us. But I'll, So I'll go on both sides. But if I see someone who, who just doesn't like it, now they might have a, be having a bad day, so you have to be careful. Then I get in trouble with my wife all the time because she used to be a flight attendant. <laughs> <laughs> she says, not your job to make that uh, call. <laughs> um, okay, other questions? Yes? So um, I work with the federal government currently, and well, they're, they're, they're realizing, not realizing, but we are having a few amount of people retiring this year. Right. And they started sitting us in meetings with uh, knowledge assessments or knowledge management assessments, and they asked a couple questions on, I just started recently, uh, my relationship with my manager and teammates and things like that, um, to gauge, I guess, a, a, a better um, future I guess to see how long people will stay there. What are your thoughts on that knowledge assessment or knowledge I, I really get frustrated when I hear they ask these questions, do you like your, do you like your boss? Yeah. Um, do you like this place? Yeah. Um, can you do the work? What are your aspirations? What's the nature of the cohort? The government cohorts is aging. Great place to get promoted now is to go into the government because the Average age of the uh, senior civilian is about 58 or 59, so there's going to be a lot of retirements. Um, uh, but you know, do you have as much flexibility and freedom in the government? No, um, in terms of that. But so I, I you know, they, they'll use that. I'm surprised they're not doing the Myers Briggs and asking you, uh, you know, and, and pigeonholing you with all that stuff. But I hate to tell you this, but it doesn't matter. If we if we have Years of effort just to stick to work. What do you want to do? I want to be this. I want to run this damn agency when I'm 50. All right? Well, you're 49 now. It's going to be hard pressed. <laughs> so, but if I want youngsters, then what's my plan? To move them consistent with their capability. Because left to the system, you'll be a manager for the rest of your life. Unless somebody comes in there and figures it out. And so, who's in charge of the talent pool? Whose work is that? It's supposed to be a good agent. Yeah. You have, you have to build a war room. The war room is, who's leaving? Well, I manage, I want to be careful. How I, I manage talent pool by managing cohorts, age groups. I'm not interested in I, I am interested in the fact that I, in the military it's easy because you got up and out. And everybody has to get out. They can only stay so long. So you've got a, a flow process. It's not quite so easy in industry. But 
you need to make sure that you've got your 20 to 30 cohort as a place to go. Your 40 to 50 cohort. So how do I get my senior people to retire? I put a lot of pressure on them to perform. If they don't perform, I'm sorry, I might lose them. And I take the hard cut. If I tolerate a mediocre leader, I have, not only do I tolerate a mediocre leader, but that person has really screwed up all the people below me. And it's not fair to them. So I can't sit back and let a mediocre leader stay in the company. I have an obligation to deal with it. I know it's hard. And I know, you know, it's the human dimension is always hard. Why, do you like, why don't you like me? It's not that I don't like you. You're not doing your job. What's my job? Here's the work I want you to do. You're not doing this. So anchor it in work. What happens is we don't deal with it because we don't want to deal with it from a work point of view. We deal with it from a frivolous point of view. Look, I don't care if I don't like the way she dresses. Does that interfere with her work? It might. It might. And I might say something to a person about that. You can't dress that way in this company. Okay, other questions? We've got one. What time do we have to finish? Uh, I think we have another five minutes. What time is it now? Oh. Five right, minutes, you, you, one more question. You're, you're nervous back there. You're still worried about that level one, two, right? No, I'm not worried. It just seems to be a little disturbing that someone could be at level one and never progress. And never, never progress. Um, Guess what? They're probably pretty happy. If you talk to them, they're probably pretty comfortable with their life and they're not stressed and they probably are okay with it. I, I just expected to see a higher rate of change, I guess. Well, we're, we're engineering out in modern society a lot of level one jobs. And I don't think you should keep a person who's level two capable in a level one job if they don't want to stay. There's lots of reasons why a person might want to stay. They like what they're doing. They like the people. Uh, it fits their schedule in terms of uh, that, um, and so they're willing to put up with it, and they use their excess capacity somewhere else, with yeah. the family or the kids. Um, One question? There are, but there are some people that that's their capability. And um, now, I, are you worried about the other end? Level nine and eight? Well, at level nine and eight, what's concerning is the fact that you have a low number of individuals there too. So I'm thinking, well, is that just natural skill knowledge or is it just learned skill knowledge? It's a combination of capability and, and how, how many Jack Welch's did we miss? Because we only have a certain number of business units and we only have a certain, so we took Jack Welch at 34, but how, were there five others that we didn't put in there? I'm convinced there are. I'm convinced we have a latent pool of underemployed people mm -hmm. yeah. out there that we could tap if we really wanted to. But in order for me to tap them, I got to get rid of some people. I got a lot of blockers. I know you don't like to hear that term, but I got a lot of blockers that are blocking everybody. And uh, so, what do I do with them? Uh, do I have the tough conversation? I'm in the middle now of, of uh, you know, I, I work in Mexico a fair amount. And, one day I had to, the Latins don't like to tell each other the truth about their capability. So one day I had to tell a manager, I said, the boss doesn't like you. I have no idea why. He doesn't like you. And you're dead in the water in this company. I suggest you go quit tomorrow, but I would start looking for a new job. Because you're not going to go anywhere in this company. I'm sorry. That's just the truth. It isn't fair. What I, see here, we pick people all the time. We make assessments and judgments all the time. But a lot of it's faulty. It's not based upon work. It's not based upon other things. It's based upon some faulty assumptions. Do they have the right temperament? I don't know. Look, people are all different. Be yourself. Here's the fact. If I put you under enough stress, you're going to revert back to the RA. Yes, with time and effort, you can become more reflective and more. I love it. We're going to send her to, uh, what's that term? Assertiveness training. So where does that where does ambition fit in that? Ambition fits in that. Look, I want if you if you want to get ahead, tell me. The system needs there needs to be a way for you to surface that that, that you want to get ahead. 
that you're frustrated by being where you are. Okay? Don't let that, don't let that always fall on the boss. That's why I think you need that, that other system in the, in the place to be able to do that. Uh, a better so, question? Go okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, uh, I believe that you know, people naturally uh, want to succeed. And you know, if we take companies, most of the payment, you know, the, the, the uh, compensation is the thing that is the thing is double attached to, uh, to performance. Uh, and uh, in my in my opinion, no one, I mean, uh, if they can put people into the right space and if they can explore their full potential, you know, they will say, uh, companies will succeed and the uh, success of the company, the success of the leaders. So, in my opinion, why why people, I mean, why uh, it is only the organization structure that for me, internal people, people are limited uh, to put everybody to, to their potential. They're, I mean, they have the resources and there are other factors. So, rather than I uh, just can't blame the leadership, uh, but it's like people, the leadership is compounded with a lot of uh, constraints, external factors. So it's not just the leadership capacity in and other factors are being limited. Yeah, they're, they're capability is capacity plus some other variables. Got to have it all. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's just capacity. What I am saying is if you have capacity, it's necessary but not sufficient. You have to value the work. You have to like what you're doing. You have to have the skill and knowledge. Now, I can give you skill and knowledge. And you'll pick it up quickly if you have the capacity. And you have to have some uh, reasonable temperament that fits with that particular uh, job area. Um, I remember a... Uh, Uh, let's go back to this one. We had a 20, highest potential person in Whirlpool was a 28-year-old female mark. 28, highest potential. How, how do I be highest potential? She was in a level three job, and her boss two levels up and said she could be a level five right now. That was their judgment. So she was in a level three job, but she could do a level five. Marketing, VP of marketing job opened in Brazil. I said, why'd you put her there? Can't. Why? She's too young. She's 28. I said, wait a minute. Your managers, and you all agreed, because we did this in the war, you all agreed that she was the highest potential person in the whole company. She happens to be in marketing, and she happens to speak Portuguese. <laughs> now why in the world wouldn't you send her down there? Because she's young. Who cares? Well, they did, and she's doing fine. Same company called, told the CEO, I said, you got to get rid of this gal on HR. They're going to kill her. She's the second highest person in capability in the company. She's more capable than all the men in HR, and they're going to kill her because they don't want her to look good. And if you don't move her, she's dead. She'll leave. And they moved. I said, look, you can live with, and where do you want your hot shots? In staff, or you want them in line jobs. Put her in a line job. Wow, she's an HR person. So what? Who cares? I don't care what your degree's in. I really don't care what your degree's in. What do you want to do? I can teach you production. I can teach you marketing. I can teach you sales. I don't care where you went to school. I can give you all that other skill knowledge stuff, but if you don't have the capacity or the values, I'm, I'm going to be whistling Dixon. Mm -hmm. yes. well, I just wanted to say, I, I, I think I've seen situations where an individual has capacity, but they don't want to move up into higher positions or take on responsibilities. That they're, they're great at what they're doing, and they could be doing more, but they choose, and this was the question about the ambition in that, yeah. they choose to stay in a level three position, and they're really, really good at that. So you can't, I agree with you, you can't make a judgment. I mean, that, that the individual also takes right. responsibility for where they're at. So 
one of the things that, and, and Lord, I'm a professor at a university, but you know, not everybody wants to come right. and have a college degree. There are the thank God, goodness we have people who want to do things with their hands, who want to be master plumbers and that right. kind of thing. So I don't think we can. I, in, in some respects, to me, I understand what this is about the level one in that, and I think it sounds like we're slamming somebody, but I no. think it's we're a very diverse Absolutely. world, and we need really different capabilities at the different levels, yeah. I think, because there are jobs that need people at those capability levels. And I have no problem with, with any of that, but if I'm managing a pool and I have mm -hmm. everybody at three, comfortable at three, well, yeah, no, I then I've got a problem. Exam. Yeah. Um, in terms right. of, so I've got to manage my pool right. and my cohort and do all of those kinds of things. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Look, you need to do what you need to do, what you're comfortable doing. Okay, good job. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions, please come up and uh, talk to Dr. Clement. And again, thank you for, Dr. Bernardi, thank you for our visit. Thank you. 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 Oh, okay. That's yeah, go ahead. What's your question? We traded off. So we had, we worked a deal. These these young I teach actually I teach nonprofit management. Okay. And and my class this semester is governance and executive leadership. So we went to a, I took them to a board meeting Monday night. Right. I want you to see what a board meeting is. So I come to uh, Dr. Uh, Sergey here and say, okay, I need these students to give them permission to miss your class so we can go to the board meeting. And he says to me, okay, on Wednesday night, I have a speaker. You have to bring your students. <laughs> said, okay. All right. Good. It's a deal. Going back to the women's and jobs. Yeah. Um, I don't this know is a high potential graduate student. Okay. Yes, these are, these um, definitely. The McKinley company uh, was doing uh, extensive outreach about two or three months ago looking at the women who took maternity, maternity leave and never came back. So they launched like this whole new initiative of reaching out to them and seeing if they would be willing to come back to McKinley. Um, and they haven't released any information or any reports, but it'd be interesting finding. Is it McKinley or McKinsey? Sorry, McKinsey. McKinsey, yeah. Yeah, McKinsey. Yeah. Um, which I thought was really that. interesting, because yeah. Yeah, that, that the would outreach. Be. Well, that's because they probably have some really high potential people wow. that they don't want to lose, too. Well, McKinsey, well, I can yes. tell you, they, they, they get the best of the brightest. The best, yes. And then what they do is, if you don't get partner in five years, you're out. You're out. Yeah. And so, but it, they're losing. You know, so. And they're losing some really good people because right. of the... Uh, and so they need to figure out, how do I get these people back? Because right. they're capable. Right. That's like, like uh, Booz Allen was that way. Yeah. Like, up or out. You know, progress within a certain amount of time. So, but uh, yeah, see, Sir Robert was uh, McKinsey. He was a partner, twenty-eight. Wow. Oh my gosh. And so I mean, you know, so that obviously he's capable. Well, yeah, he was working with GE, doing the business unit model with uh, the CEO. That's where he met Welch. And th those guys are. There's not a lot of them, but no. they're really capable. Now, I think Jack Welch. You know, Jack Welch got divorced at fifty-five because his wife ran the house. He didn't, he didn't do squat with the family. Mm -hmm. And then he had this, you know, he married his Harvard Business School graduate faculty professor. Uh, who's about 30 years younger than yeah, 20 right, years. Right, right. So he's starting the other part of his life. Yeah. And he missed out on the first and I'm not, and I'm not saying value-wise that I, I support that. Right. Um, because I think that that... Uh, well, we see that in the military. My, my husband ran pharmacies. And um, we'd always see, he'd t come with the ID cards and would have, you know, wife three, four, or whatever sometimes. But, but will that, okay, in the military, when you're young, you are gone. 
and you're in, you're running a battalion and then a brigade and on up, and your family life is nada. So then you retire and you figure out, eh, maybe I missed something. So, so there, there's nothing free. My yeah. potential, sir, there's nothing free in life. That's right. That's right. Can we help the, so, the PowerPoint over email? I'm sorry? The PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm just hopeful that I've recorded the whole session. Oh, I'm still recording, actually. You can say hi. Ah, <laughs> oh, we're still on tape. Good. We're going to finish this so I can get it to the printer tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. So. yeah, thanks so much. Thanks. Yeah. It's fun. Good yeah. work. Yeah, that's not my best uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's because they're in my class. <laughs> So now we need to steal them. We need to steal them. Put them in the right job. Yeah, well, they will be. Thanks, dude. This was fun. Okay.